Well, I'm happy to be here today to talk uh, about diet and heart disease risk, and specifically um, targeting women. So today, I'm going to share with you the role of food and lifestyle in heart disease development or prevention, and point out foods that raise cholesterol and your heart disease risk, and foods that can lower cholesterol and your heart disease risk. Now, although there's many interventions we can do to reduce risk, I've tried to consolidate it into top six things that women can do to reduce our risk. So I know Dr. Dow talked about heart disease risk factors for women. Uh, for men, you know, 45 and over is a risk factor for heart disease. For women, it's a little bit older as we are closer to menopause age, 54, 55. And I think that's related to our declining uh, rates of estrogen, which they think may be protective. And then, of course, some of these risk factors we cannot have any control over, our genetics and our age. but. Some of the other things we can do, excess weight, what we eat, we can work on. Six interventions I'm gonna talk about is follow a healthy eating pattern most of the time. So that means we don't have to be perfect, but what we're doing the majority of the time, kind of the rule is 80% of the time if we're eating healthy, there can be some, some wiggle room in there for other things. Uh, be physically active and maintain a healthy weight. Be moderate with alcohol intake if you drink. Reduce sodium in the diet, stop smoking if you smoke, and find ways to reduce stress every day. So of course we can you know, watch what we eat, watch our intake, try to make good food choices. But if we're not also doing things in these other areas, um, it's, you know, we have to kind of think of the, the whole holistic approach to reducing our risk for heart disease. So eat healthy mostly or most of the time is very kind of generic. Um, there's not just one right way to eat healthy. There's lots of different diets out there that are, and by diet I don't mean a weight loss diet, but just kind of a pattern of eating that can be healthy. So ask yourself, does your eating plan that you generally follow, does it look like this? Do you eat a lot of vegetables and fruits? Do you eat a lot of whole grains and high fiber foods? If you have red meat, are they small servings? Are they lean choices? Do you include some fish meals every week? Are you trying to limit saturated fat and avoiding trans fat as much as you can? And watching your intake of sodium. So if you're doing these things, you're on the right track. There used to be more of an emphasis, you know, there's been kind of a paradigm shift on what we focus on as far as fat. So uh, researchers, you know, the message used to be, eat a low-fat diet for heart health. And with more research and time, it's really become, um, uh, you know, looking at the type of fat that's consumed is important. And there's other foods such as carbohydrates and sugars, which also have an influence on our heart disease risk. So the message is no longer eat a low-fat diet. You have to think about the type of fats that you're including. The, so we think quantity, also, so if you're, you know, of course, trying to maintain your weight or lose weight, even if it's a, a, what we categorize as a healthy fat, we don't want to eat too much of it, and the quality, so what types of fats are we choosing mostly? One of the diets that is considered heart healthy would be the Mediterranean diet or pattern of eating. And they did some actual randomized controlled studies and fed people just a strict low-fat diet, and then they gave the other group a Mediterranean type of diet, which is you know high intake of olive oil, monounsaturated fats, fruits, nuts, vegetables, moderate intake of fish and poultry, low intake of dairy, red meats, processed meats, and sweets. And there was a lower incidence of cardiovascular events in the groups that were following the Mediterranean diet. This is just another you know, option or pattern. This also typically includes wine, which not everyone drinks alcohol, but uh, moderate intake of wine is also there. Because high cholesterol levels are a risk factor, we have to look at what foods raise our cholesterol level, and also triglyceride levels in the blood. So small amounts of cholesterol are you know, needed in the body. It's, it's part of cell membranes. It's used to make hormones. When there's excess cholesterol circulating, that's where 
it can kind of cause problems. Triglycerides are a storage form of fat. They can circulate in the blood. If you have high levels of that, that's also something that can stick to you know, artery walls and kind of contribute to accumulation and blockages. In both cases, if you eat a high carbohydrate diet, if you are overweight, if you are not physically active, and also age and gender, those things can raise our cholesterol levels and our triglyceride levels. Specifically, saturated fat is the type of fat we target when we're trying to lower cholesterol. And that's found um, in marbled meats, higher fat saturated meats, fatty cuts of meat. So if you were looking at, say, a ribeye in the store, that's going to have a lot more saturated fat than a piece of filet mignon or sirloin. So you can kind of tell just looking at the meat, the, the leaner cuts. Full fat dairy has a lot more saturated fat than non-fat or low fat. Cheese and butter are very high in saturated fat. Lard, if you choose chicken breast, it's lower in saturated fat, but the dark meat of the chicken or the skin is going to have more saturated fat. And it's not just in foods that come from animals. There's tropical oils that are high in saturated fat. So on packaged foods, if you look at sometimes cookies or crackers, palm kernel oil is often used, palm oil, and those are high in saturated fat. Coconut oil and cocoa butter are also high. So to make choices that decrease your saturated fat, choose skinless chicken breast more often than the dark meat, such as the wing and the thigh. Buy lean cuts of meat, such as round or sirloin and loin, and try to eat it less often. And Overall, if you plan you know, a few meatless meals during the week, that's also a great way to decrease your overall, um, you know, your average intake of saturated fat. So I made a little chart to show you the comparison of saturated fat in different foods. At the top there, there's a, a range, aim for eight to 13 grams of saturated fat per day. For women, for most of us in this room, we wanna to try to aim for that lower end of the range, so between maybe eight and 10. So if you're looking at a packaged food that has a nutrition label, you can see how much saturated fat is in that product and, and you can you know, decide, is that something I can fit into my, my meal plan? So of course, if it's a vegetable like broccoli, spinach, tomatoes, carrots, there's not gonna be any saturated fat. Um, and there's very small amounts in some of these foods here, like the lima beans, shrimp, although it's high in cholesterol, it's very low in saturated fat. And so a seafood meal is always going to be lower in saturated fat and a better choice than red meat, regardless of the type of fish. And just to s compare um, whole milk to low fat milk. So if you, you know, don't want to give up your whole milk, but how many glasses a day are you drinking? Because one eight ounce glass of whole milk has over five grams of saturated fat. So that's about half of your goal or what you would want to have for the day. And then Preparation can also add saturated fat. So for example, I have a frozen, this is Paul's fish here, a, a batter dipped fish. And so when you're looking at packaged foods, what's the preparation, what have they added to it? So you start with something that's pretty low in saturated fat like fish, but then the batter that they've added to it increases the fat quite a bit. And then there at the bottom are a couple red meat choices, something like pork spare ribs, very high saturated fat. So hopefully that's not something you're eating often or on a regular basis, but that would be more of a, you know, if you like them, a once in a while food, since it's, uh, they're very high. Trans fats, like saturated fat, also increase your LDL cholesterol, which we call the bad cholesterol, lousy cholesterol. There are small amounts of trans fat found naturally in nature, but most in the food supply is coming from commercial manufacturers. So back when they were trying to provide more of a low-fat diet, when that was more the craze, manufacturers took liquid vegetable oils, which they thought were healthier, but they hydrogenated them to increase the shelf life and the uh, stability of the product so they you know, could last longer. But now with time and research, we know that trans fats are just as bad or worse for the heart than saturated fats. So they are supposed to be you know, coming out of the food supply as much as possible. Um, but you still need to look on packaged foods to see, does it have hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated fats? 
on the nutrition fact label, it might say trans fat zero, but check the ingredients as well because if it's less than half a gram of trans fat in that serving, they can say zero, but it may still have some in the packaged food. So if you eat enough of that packaged food, you may have you know, a good amount of trans fat that you're consuming. One reason trans fat is almost worse than saturated fat is that it decreases your HDL. If you're choosing liquid oils, you're avoiding trans fat. If you cook with naturally occurring unhydrogenated oils, you're avoiding trans fat. Avoid hard stick margarines. There's some debate or controversy over is butter better? Now, butter is high in saturated fats, so just keep that in mind. It, it really depends how much you use. If you prefer to use butter and you're using very small amounts, that's your, you know, that's your choice. Or look for a soft tub liquid margarine that the first few ingredients should be either liquid oil or water and it should not have any hydrogenated fats. To kind of give you a summary with added fats, the healthier ones would be your liquid, canola, olive oil, soybean, flaxseed, safflower. So these are some examples. These are a combination of both monounsaturated and polyunsaturated oils. And less healthy would be butter, lard, hydrogenated oils, and the tropical oils. I have had questions about coconut oil sometimes. Some people like to cook with it. It should not be the primary oil that you cook with or use. Um, it, it does have, you know, some people like the flavor. They think it maybe has some health benefits. It does raise your satur it does raise your HDL cholesterol level. So, so that's kind of the argument that maybe it's, it's not bad. But it also raises your LDL. So we know that you know, anything that raises your LDL is not good. We don't know if, because it also raises your HDL, does that make, make it a good oil? So it should still be in that category of limit or avoid. You know, in our arteries, one of the things that they think can lead to the formation of plaques, it's when the artery wall is damaged. And one of the things that can damage the artery wall is high blood pressure. That's why it's important to control our blood pressure. Also inflammation. So we know there's even foods that may increase inflammation in the body. High density lipoprotein or HDL is good because it kind of cleans the blood. It, it, it's a carrier protein that takes cholesterol away from the heart and to the liver and the liver breaks it down. So that decreases the risk of those blockages in the arteries. But our HDL can sometimes be low if we have high triglyceride levels, trans fat intake can affect it, if we smoke, or if we're not active. Exercise can have some impact on HDL, not a, a big impact if you're not also kind of watching these other things. And then LDL, you know, the reason we target LDL cholesterol is because it is also a carrier protein. It takes cholesterol in the direction of the heart and its arteries, and it can be oxidized or basically damaged in the arteries. And so that is what can also contribute to inflammation. And then where there's inflammation, more things can stick and that can kind of form those, those plaques. So what can oxidize LDL? Smoking, diabetes, if you don't control it well. Uh, if you have a, a, a low intake of antioxidants, which can kind of fight that oxidation in the body, or if we have hypertension or high triglyceride levels. So all those things can increase our risk for oxidizing LDL. So some of the things we can do to decrease inflammation in the body, I'm gonna kind of talk about. Foods that can increase inflammation are if you have excessive intake of added sugars and refined carbohydrates. So by refined carbohydrates, I'm talking about like cookies, chips, <laughs> those kind of things. If you have a high intake of saturated fat, and then some of these are not diet related like smoking and hypertension, if your diabetes is not well controlled. So again, you have to kind of keep an eye on, on some of these other things as well. But what we know about what we call pro-inflammatory foods, these are foods that can increase inflammation in the body. So if you have an excess, excessive consumption of refined sugars, like candy, pastries, sugar, sweetened beverages. That's why there's really a push to decrease our intake of sugar-sweetened beverages, even juice if consumed in small amounts. Um, highly processed carbohydrates like donuts, potato chips, crackers, like I mentioned. 
And then certain oils increase inflammation, like hydrogenated oils and partially hydrogenated oils. We know processed meats can increase inflammation. They also are linked to colorectal cancer, saturated fats in general. So these are pro-inflammatory foods. And I'll give you some examples of anti-inflammatory. So these are mostly foods from the plant kingdom, except for fish, so fish is on the list. But beans and legumes, which would be like peas and lentils, tofu, beverages like green tea and wine are anti-inflammatory. Uh, fish. <laughs> Fruits like apples, all the berries, cherries, citrus, pineapple, tomatoes. And there's even herbs that are anti-inflammatory. And these are not in supplement form. I'm suggesting, you know, you know, if you're going to add them, add them in their, their natural form, like in cooking, etc. Nuts, almonds, hazelnuts, walnuts, certain oils are anti-inflammatory. And so what's also good about canola and uh, like extra virgin olive oil is it has a neutral effect on the heart. It doesn't raise LDL cholesterol. Dark chocolate and cocoa. So if you, you know, add dark chocolate, make sure it's in small amounts. And then vegetables like bell peppers, broccoli, cabbage. So a lot of the cruciferous vegetables, sweet potatoes. So those are anti-inflammatory foods. So there's a lot of, um, in addition to being anti-inflammatory, you know, they've looked at the omega-3 polyunsaturated fats that are in fish. And in studies, they've seen reduction in heart arrhythmias. They can lower triglycerides. So some of you may be on a prescription level of fish oils by your doctor. They can help lower blood pressure and slow the progression of plaques in the arteries. Like I said, they have an anti-inflammatory effect. So uh, try to aim for two fish meals per week. On the right side, there are plant-based omega-3 fats if you don't eat fish or you're vegetarian. So you can get those. They're not exactly the same as the type of oil that's in fish, but they're also beneficial. So like green leafy vegetables, flaxseed, flaxseed oil, canola, soybeans, walnuts, and uh, wheat germ oil. Of course, fish. Some of, these are some of the fattier fish that have higher levels of the omega-3 fats. With fish, it's just a good idea to eat a variety of fish to sort of spread your, your risk. Because in some, you know, if you eat, say, only lake trout, there might be pollutants in that lake. You might be exposing yourself to you know, a particular pollutant. So if you eat a variety of fish, you know, maybe some, some wild, some freshwater, some ocean fish, that's better. Another dietary thing you can do is make sure you're adding soluble fiber. So soluble fiber in the gut acts like a sponge to help bind the cholesterol that's in the food we're eating or the saturated fat. So rather than it get processed and digested, it goes out with our bowel movement. So things like barley and oats are great, psyllium. Uh, psyllium fiber is, is actually on the market. I think that's in Metamucil. Then lots of fruits are good sources of soluble fiber. And usually fruits and vegetables are a combination of soluble and insoluble. So like the outside of your apple, the skin is insoluble, but the actual fruit is a soluble fiber. Oranges are great, all kinds of beans and soy products. So I'm gonna kind of quickly go through my other top six interventions. Since Dr. Dow covered a lot of this, but try to be physically active. And when I, you know, when I see patients, we, we also do outpatient counseling. And I always touch on exercise because if the goal really is to lose weight, you have to be physically active in addition to watching what you eat. I mean, you'll just see you know, the benefits more. So for most of us, try to do at least 150 minutes per week. And that can be broken up into you know, like 20 minute intervals. It doesn't have to be you know, an hour at a time or um, just what, what you can fit in. It could be aqua aerobics. Um, that would be moderate intensity. It could be brisk walking, biking. It should be an activity you can talk, hold a conversation while you're doing it. That's more of a moderate. If you can, if you're you know, physically able to, doing some vigorous activity, at least 75 minutes per week, would also be beneficial. So something that I jogging or hiking uphill, doing an elliptical if you can, that would also be helpful. Muscle strengthening. So weight training exercises like handheld weights, resistant bands, help 
actually strengthen the muscle, heart muscle itself, and also help maintain lean body mass. So muscle is more of an active tissue than, than fat tissue. So we want to try to maintain our muscle as we get older. And there's a tendency as we get older to, for our muscle mass to decline. So we have to fight that by doing strength training and um, weight training exercises. They, these can also be chair exercises if that's what you're able to do. And the truth is to lose weight in you know, our adult years uh, or sustain weight loss, we probably have to do more like 60 to 90 minutes most days of the week. You know, that's kind of the reality. Unless you're, you know, your diet along with that is very, very careful and, and controlled. Um, so if your doctor shares with you like your BMI or if you, that's something that you can actually calculate on your own if you know your height and your weight. Uh, if you go to the CDC site, they have a calculator and you plug that in and it'll tell you what your BMI is. So a healthy BMI is somewhere between 18.5 and 24.9. Above 24.9, that's considered overweight. And so that's going to increase your risk for heart disease. Or if you measure your waist circumference less than 35, is healthy. Third intervention. If you drink alcohol, drink in moderation. So for women, that's one drink per day or less. Try to drink it with your meal. Be mindful of the added calories, though. So, of course, if you're trying to maintain or lose weight, an alcoholic drink is going to add calories, depending on what it is. Try to limit those that have added syrups, like a margarita, uh, something that has um, <laughs> a mixer in it that will add additional calories. So one drink equivalent is five ounces of wine, or 12 ounces of beer, or one and a half ounces of a, a spirit, 80 proof, or one ounce of a spirit that's 100 proof. Now reduce sodium in the diet. Is, is, this is another important one, and this is a little bit more difficult depending on where we're eating our food. If we're buying a lot of processed food or eating out a lot, we have less control over how much sodium we're eating. So one of my suggestions is try to eat more at home or, or cook meals for yourself more. Those that do that really have more of a, you know, a, a ability to get down to the sodium goals here. But sodium, you know, it's primarily consumed as salt, table salt. It has a lot of uses in cooking, in preserving foods, curing meat. Interesting though, you know, the majority of the sodium in our diet, it comes from processed foods, packaged foods, not the salt shaker at the table. So that's where we have to really look. And it does raise our blood pressure. Plenty of studies show this. As sodium intake increases, our blood pressure increases. And conversely, when people are able to decrease their sodium intake, their blood pressure also improves. If that's a goal of yours to try to you know, improve blood pressure or prevent you know, having to take medication, then look at your sodium intake. So I have one product here um, because what I want to suggest is you know, compare at the store because even um, between, you know, if you're looking at soups, if you're looking at crackers, between different brands and different products, there can be a big difference in sodium. So really compare and try to make choices that are lower sodium. This soup, for example, um, I don't know if you can see the numbers. It's pretty good for sodium. One cup has 290 milligrams. So a typical soup, a regular soup has maybe 600, could be have 1,000 depending on what's in it. So you, know, you can find lower sodium options now which is good. So manufacturers are trying to kind of respond to consumer demand. So there's a lot of strategies to reduce sodium. So try to cook with less salt. Again, the majority of the salt in our, our diet is, or sodium is coming from processed foods. Probably not if you're using a small amount in cooking, that's okay. But if you're using things like soy sauce, oyster sauce, those add a lot of sodium. So try to avoid that. Try to reduce and eliminate your fast food intake. Again, eating out. There's a eating plan, the DASH eating plan, which um, DASH stands for its acronym, Dietary Approaches to, to Stop Hypertension. And in this study, participants followed a diet that provided about 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. And they had significant reductions in blood pressure. They think because they ate a lot of fruits and vegetables, which were sources of potassium, and calcium and magnesium, and those are natural blood pressure reducers in the, in the body. So it's a lot of whole grains, vegetables, fruits, if you include dairy products, fat-free or low-fat, things like nuts and seeds and legumes. 
which uh, those have the magnesium that, that they were encouraging. At the same time, in limiting intake of sodium, fat, sweets, and sugars. So the DASH eating plan is another plan that they've kind of said it can be something to follow even just for, you know, for weight maintenance because there's not a lot of room if you really try to follow this. There's not a lot of room for outside food, uh, extras, things like sweets. So um, it's a pretty healthy plan as well. So the average American consumes 3,500 milligrams of sodium or more. Current recommendations are to reduce to less than 2,300 milligrams a day, which it's doable. I'd say it's not easy, um, depending on, again, where you're eating your meals. So I would say if your first step, if you want to do it in incremental steps, is try to reduce your sodium intake by 1,000 milligrams a day. So look at foods you're eating now that give you the sodium content, try to, try to reduce at least by 1,000. You'll probably see benefits even with that reduction. And then, you know, if you can reduce further, that's good. There are certain populations that are more at risk. So if you are older than 51, if you're African American, if you already have hypertension or diabetes or chronic kidney disease, a lower sodium intake is really recommended, more like 1,500 milligrams a day which is, again, doable, but you're not eating out. You're eating all your meals at home, probably, and, and being careful about um, cooking from scratch, basically. Uh, one of your handouts is the Salty Six. So these are foods, when you're at the store, again, compare between products. There's going to be a lot of difference in sodium between different breads, between different cold cuts and cured meats, if you buy those. Sandwiches overall can be high sodium, depending on the filling. You know, if you've got cheese in there and the bread and maybe a meat, sodium can really add up. Look at things like pizza. So the toppings can really increase the sodium if you're adding things like pepperoni or salami or sausage versus maybe vegetables, the sodium will be a lot different. And then soups and chicken. So chicken at the store, you can, of course, if you're buying just fresh chicken, there's not any added sodium. But if you're buying it, if it's frozen or processed in some way, you know, check, you know, if it's got any kind of maybe injected flavors, you know, it could be high in sodium. So healthy shopping tips, try to stay in the perimeter of the store. Produce department, the dairy department, the fish, the meat department, and try to avoid those aisles with all the processed food as much as you can. Read nutrition labels again on food packages and remember with ingredients, they're listed in descending order by weight. So the first ingredient is what that is primarily in that product. So if the first few ingredients include salt, or sugar or fat, you might, you know, maybe want to avoid that product. In general, choose foods that have less than 300 milligrams sodium per serving. That's kind of a good rule of thumb. Try to fill up on fiber. So cereals that have at least five grams of fiber per serving are, are a good choice. And breads that have at least two grams of fiber per serving are a good choice. My other interventions here, smoking cessation if you smoke. It can contribute to early menopause can lower your good cholesterol, your HDL. There's a lot of benefits to stopping smoking. Reducing stress, so there is a mental health component to heart disease. We have to find ways on a regular basis to reduce stress. Exercise is a great one. Yoga is another. Daily yoga, you know, they've done studies and it's linked to reduce stress, lower anxiety, uh, lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol. Meditation is another. Our Women's Center has exercise classes, also has a meditation class. That would be a great thing to add. So when we meditate, the brain releases happy chemicals, pain diminishes, blood pressure drops. Uh, we have improved digestion. So, you know, we manifest stress in different ways. Some of us get headaches, some of us get stomach aches, ulcers, some of us get muscle pain. So we want to relieve that any way we can. The last one is a, a daily gratitude ritual, which I recently read about this finding positive things that you can give thanks for. Take note of all the positive, good things in your life. Count your blessings. Doing that can improve your mood, reduce stress, depression, blood pressure, and those stress hormone levels. So that's a, something to, you know, some people keep a gratitude journal and every day they take note of things that are, are good and positive in their life. So in summary, 
Our top six interventions follow a healthy eating plan most of the time. Be physically active and maintain a healthy weight. Uh, be moderate with your alcohol intake. Try to reduce sodium in the diet and stop smoking if you smoke. And uh, find ways to reduce stress every day. So I have online resources. These are great places to go look if you want to look up more about the DASH diet or about any other specific diets. And specific information for women is in that last link there, Department of Health and Human Services, and they have an office for women. So, And uh, that's you, it. Thank you. Thank you.